Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher's history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fist, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher's history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. Hello, welcome into a teacher of history of the United States. Thanks so much for joining us again today. Did you know that at the outbreak of the War of 1812, the United States of America, again, thought that it would be able to easily conquer Canada and failed spectacularly? Did you know that the United States would burn the provincial capital of Ontario that, would be, that we all know of as Toronto? Yes. And did you know that an American general, General Hall, through fear and paranoia, actually surrendered a much larger force to a smaller British one without even trying to defend himself? Did you know all of this? Maybe. Maybe not. Get your notebooks out because today we will cover that and more in episode 101, The War of 1812, Canada and the Northwest. All right, everyone, welcome in to episode 101. Thanks for joining us today. I am joined by my fellow history nerd, Zach. Zach Woods, welcome back to the podcast, bud. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be back. And you are ready to talk about some War of 1812, huh? Yes, the stuff that happened in my backyard of Ohio and all the little towns and forts and areas that I grew up going to, I get to share with everybody else. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, Before we get started, I do want to throw out the book recommendation for this week. It is The War of 1812, A Forgotten Conflict by Donald R. Hickey. It's a book that both Zach and I have read. Correct, Zach? Yes. You've read this one? Yes, that's what I thought. Um, pretty sure you're the one that told me about it a long time ago, and uh, it was really good and really detailed. And so um, we both use that uh, amongst a lot of other things to get ready for the episode today. At the end of episode 100, we talked about preparations for war. Uh, we talked about the election of 1812, right, the re-election of James Madison. And then I mentioned how we were going to be breaking the War of 1812 up sort of loosely into three different theaters of war, the first being Canada and the Northwest, and then we were going to have the East and then the South. So today we're going to be talking about Canada and the Northwest. And as I mentioned at the end of episode 100, Congress had been preparing measures for war. They were ready to use both commercial restrictions and force to fight this conflict. And on July 6th, 1812, when Congress adjourned, they had adopted 143 laws to prepare for war and felt like they'd gotten themselves into a pretty good position to fight the Second War of Independence. After the declaration of war, Madison visited all the departments in the executive to lend them support in this campaign, and this was very symbolic that he did this uh, because at this time, the army was in a bit of disarray. Most men were inexperienced. Morale was very low. It was actually so bad at one point that Madison even pardoned deserters as long as they returned within four months. So – um That's when you know you're desperate, when you pardon deserters, as long as they come back within four months. As I mentioned in episode 100, Congress greatly increased the bounty in order to pay – you know, which is the pay uh, for the soldiers in order to try to spur more enlistment into the army. Um, I also mentioned that in episode 100 how the U.S. was really unable to drum up interest in volunteer soldiers for this war. 
Um, the state militias were in disarray in a large majority of the U.S., and the manpower problems weren't the only problems the U.S. was facing here at the outbreak of the War of 1812. There were also payment issues and supply issues. So when the war breaks out, privates in the army, even after they got a raise, only earned $8 a month, which was about half of what an unskilled laborer made in regular society. There was poor communication, there were slow processes. This made the payments very delayed, so even they were getting these menial payments, and um, those menial payments weren't even coming. Sometimes they were owed back pay of 6 to 12 months, which of course led men to desert and talk about mutiny and destroy all of the morale. Yeah. Also, why why are you going to fight very hard and go attack another country if you don't even if you aren't even getting paid? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and when you do get paid, it the pay is pretty terrible. Yeah. There's a reason right? why a general of this time referred to his soldiers as the scum of the earth. Yes, because it was basically like they had, you know, they they were the skid row. They had they had no other options, so they went and fought. Um, Ten years before the war broke out in 1802, the U.S. had gotten rid of the commissary and the quartermaster departments. Thank you, President Jefferson. Don't need those, Uh, right? Don't need any organization to fight a war. (laughs) No, no. Um, The army began to be – so when the the war breaks out ten years later, they still don't have these and they rush to try and throw them together. But what happens is the army began to be supplied by private citizens. Who knew little or nothing about war and warfare and were out to make a profit. Yeah, this is um, a great and way. And that's what they cared about. This is a great way for graft corruption and basically yep. just bad things to be delivered to the soldiers, which makes morale even worse. Because if your tent has holes in it and your gun doesn't work, but it was provided by a rich merchant, <laughs> you're probably going to yeah, be pretty and, grumpy. <laughs> yeah, be, be, so what happens is when you have these private contracts, because not only – uh, be, because the supplies were depleted, right? These essentials that you were mentioning, um, tents, uh, clothes, boots, blankets, etc. They just didn't have them or they were in terrible shape. Um, the food was also left up to private contracts. It was spoiled. It was old. It wasn't up to standard. One U.S. officer said, quote, it was madness in the extreme to rely on such a system in time of war, having these private contractors supplying all this stuff. And – Here's the issue because as I mentioned, the private contractors were out to make money. The only way they could really be punished for not fulfilling their contract was through civil court. That was it, right? They weren't part of the military. They couldn't be punished through any type of military means. They were just private contractors. So, okay, fine. Take me to court and sue me. Like, whatever. Good luck with that. that, You're busy fighting a war. And given the time constraints and stuff of distance that uh, at the time, that's not something that can happen fast. (laughs) Yes, yes. And not to mention something I'll get into in a moment. The U.S. was focusing on the Canadian region and the Northwest region and getting supplies to these regions was incredibly difficult. Um, It was terrain a lot of people were unfamiliar with. It's a bit mountainous. It's heavily forested. It's very cold in the winter. Um, Major General Edmund P. Gaines said, quote, the irregularity in the supply and badness of the rations had done more to retard American operations than anything else. It's pretty hard to convince somebody to go hike, you know, 200 miles in the wilderness when they don't have good food and good clothes to go fight somebody else. Yes. And that doesn't, um, you know, we haven't even mentioned the diseases, uh, typhoid, dysentery, pneumonia, measles, uh, amongst a score of others were very common. And to make matters worse, the doctors didn't really know what they were doing, right? They were still bleeding people out. They were blistering. Um, one of the medicines that was very common medicine offered at this time was mercury, which, <laughs> you know, is not it, it what you, you want to give to right? someone. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely makes you feel something. So – To sum it all up, in case you didn't really pick up the theme that I was going with, the United States of America was incredibly unprepared for this war in pretty much every way you could imagine. But that did not stop them from having some pretty lofty goals and some uh, grand desires. One of them to conquer Canada or try to conquer Canada again. (laughs) 
And this shouldn't be too surprising. Territorial expansionism has been important throughout U.S. history. Well, I mean, all the way up to today. But even through 1776 to 1812, you can look at the Louisiana Purchase and Western expansion. And then, of course, we know we continue to expand and expand and expand over the next couple centuries. Um, Henry Clay even at one point said, quote, Canada was not the end but the means. And this was sort of an appealing option, conquering Canada. It only had 500,000 people and was pretty weak when compared to the U.S., at least on paper. The U.S. had a significant troop advantage in this region, um, especially because Britain wasn't really paying attention. Uh, It couldn't allocate reinforcements to Canada because they were at war with Napoleon in Europe. Not only this, but there was a lot of apathy to the conflict in Canada. And in some areas, it seemed like some even supported the U.S. in the war. With this in mind, it might not surprise you that some Americans actually thought that this might be a quick war. Once again, sound familiar? Some even considered it a, quote, holiday campaign because they'd be back by the end of the holidays. Federalists wanted to attack Britain on the high seas. They didn't think that a campaign in Canada was justified, whereas the Republicans were the ones wanting to go after Canada. And, you know, not everyone, though, was on board with this idea to conquer Canada. Some of those asked, okay, well, what are we going to do with Canada if we do conquer it? Uh, Joseph Pearson of North Carolina said, quote, did they, uh, they being the Republicans, did they mean to plant their standard on the walls of Quebec? portion out the lands to the conquerors and sing a requiem to free trade and sailors' rights? These questions have never been satisfactorily answered. So as the war progressed, the idea of keeping Canada grew, especially in the South and West, because Canada was the number one target. But unsurprisingly, Americans greatly underestimated how difficult Canada would be to conquer and how bravely the British and Canadian troops were going to defend their land. So the first act of this war, the first theater of this war is going to be – is going to see the United States focus primarily on Canada and then fighting expand to the northwest. In the episode today, which Zach is going to dive into more detail on the nuts and bolts of all of it, is going to start in the summer of 1812 and then continue all the way throughout 1813. And by the end of 1813 – What we'll see is this first phase of the war will put both the British and the U.S. in a position to sort of pivot, um, change strategies, and the fighting will be renewed with British vengeance on their mind on the East Coast, which we'll get to next episode. So, Zach, um, I'll sort of kick it over to you. Do you want to just set maybe some broad context for yeah. the, the, this theater of war and then we can dive dive into more details. So I want our listeners to close their eyes and picture the geography of the Great Lakes. Think of where Chicago is on Lake Michigan, the Michigan Peninsula with the Upper Peninsula, uh, down to Detroit, Lake Erie with Toledo and Cleveland into Niagara Falls and Lake Ontario. This is, the the, uh, this is the theater that is the Northwest Territories at the time. Where Chicago is will be Fort Dearborn. Uh, on the island of Mackinac will be Fort Mackinac connecting Lake Michigan to Detroit, uh, to where the Detroit River is and Fort Detroit, which is at a critical crossroads into Lake Erie. On the Niagara River, there'll be Fort Niagara into, the Ontario, into Lake Ontario. For each of these four, uh, for Fort Detroit and Fort Niagara, there is a rival British fort, Fort Malden across from Fort Detroit and Fort George across from Fort Niagara. So as Chris mentioned – And real quick, real quick, Zach, I'll put – for those listening, I'll make sure I put a map of this on Facebook and on Twitter um, and on the Patreon page. So if you're listening to this and you want to pull up the Facebook page, Facebook page, you'll see the post with the info for this episode, and you'll see a map, so you can check out the map while Zach is describing it. Yeah, so this section of the Great Lakes, the United States thinks of as the Northwest Territories, and is uh, also referred to, the Canadian side is referred to as Upper Canada. 
And the United States, as Chris mentioned, has this desire to conquer Canada. It comes in part from Westerners who view the British as the uh, source of Indian malcontents and Tecumseh's Shawnee Confederacy, Shawnee-led Confederacy, in resistance against expansion. And the desire to go conquer Upper Canada is really strong and powerful. So before the declaration of war becomes public, General William Hall is marching with uh, a force of about 2,500 men to Fort Detroit. And he is alerted to the fact that war has been declared en route. And actually, some of his orders are going to be captured crossing Lake Erie from Cleveland to Fort Detroit and fall into the hands of General Isaac Brock, who's going to be the great British general at the beginning of the war, who's going to really uh, do wonders for the Canadian and British side. So General Hall's orders are to invade Upper Canada. And at Fort Detroit, this poor logistic system that Chris mentioned really hampered his confidence. So he does some sorties across the river, but he really doesn't push his numerical advantage against Fort Malden. Isaac Brock takes the intelligence of the captured orders uh, that were captured off of the Cuyahoga schooner, uh, named after Cuyahoga County in Cleveland, um, that had the Americans' orders on them, and uses that information and the poor communication and coordination of the Americans to quickly shuttle troops from Fort George across from Niagara to Fort Detroit, where he meets Tecumseh and his Shawnee allies. To, uh, basically to challenge Hull. At the same time, Indians have attacked Fort Mackinac, which is basically between, uh, it's an it's a island that is between uh, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. And it's uh, basically, it's kind of almost like- a it, it's, all the way, it's all the way at the northernmost part of the peninsula of Michigan. Yeah. And it, you, think, yeah. you can think of it almost like a Gibraltar. It's a straight- And this is happening, this is happening- um, well, Hull's campaign began July, but right now we're in like mid-August, right? August Correct. 15th, August 16th? Yeah. Correct. Okay. So this fort falls uh, to uh, a native attack, and Hull hears of this and is very worried. So he orders the evacuation of Fort Dearborn because he can't supply it, believing that the waterways are now blocked. So he orders a land retreat. Now, this is a mistake because uh, uh, some Potawatomi allies of the Shawnee Confederacy – are basically planning to attack the fort and have it encircled. And the American commander gets these orders and goes, well, I'm surrounded, but I feel obliged to follow the orders. And he marches his troops out, and they're quickly surrounded and attacked, and it's a massacre. And Yeah, and, that, so, so, and real quick, that was Captain William Wells, correct? Correct. And so it, it, I, I think from, from what I understood – the, the assumption was so Mackinac in, in mid July, Mackinac and Michel Mackinac are conquered. Mm -hmm. And at, at this point, Hull is in Detroit. He sees what, what has happened in Mackinac and Michel and Mackinac. So he recognizes Fort Dearborn, which is where Chicago is today, um, is vulnerable. And he tells William Wells, Captain William Wells, and his men to leave. Well, William Wells, you know, apparently had made some type of agreement with the local pot of, Potawatomi tribe that they would give them every if if they allowed them to retreat right and head over to I think were were they heading over to Fort Wayne I can't yeah they were exactly. retreating back to Fort Wayne back to Fort Wayne so if they were allowed to retreat back to Fort Wayne they would give them all their supplies and goods the the booze um, the guns the clothing the food etc and that was the deal well um, in the letter that. Uh, William Wells received, it gave specific instructions not to do that because who knows what the Native Americans would do with all those things that was sort of the assumption. So when the um, young men, the warriors, the Native warriors saw that in their mind, uh, William Wells had, had gone back on his word and on his agreement, um, that's when they attacked. And um, it was it was pretty bad. They As they were marching back to Fort Wayne about two miles into the march, they all attacked. 26 regulars were killed. Um, uh, like a dozen children were killed. Two yeah, women so, were killed. So it's important to remember that these forts are not just uh, men, that there's often families yep. with them. So anytime there's – we talk of uh, a column being descended upon in retreat, it typically means that there's women and children who are either going to be uh, taken captive uh, – we can go into more detail about how Indian captive were treated and 
oftentimes were integrated into tribal communities. But pre- pretty much anytime you have one of these columns attacked, it ends up with a lot of people being killed or taken captive. Yeah. Yeah. The fort was subsequently burned. And not only that, but William Wells was decapitated. And right after they killed him, they cut his chest open and ripped his heart out and started eating his heart. Um, so they could try to get some of the courage um, from his heart because apparently he fought off quite a few natives before he finally died. So uh, they were impressed with his fighting. Um, so that sort of, you know, by mid, mid-August, mid <laughs> that's the situation. Uh, Mackinac's – Michel and Mackinac have been taken. Um, Dearborn have now been taken and Hall is sitting there um, feeling pretty exposed – and not really sure what he's going to do next. And this is where Isaac Brock having Hull's orders and some good intelligence that morale is low because of poor supply and the success of the native allies in the Northwest Territories uh, quickly shuttles troops from York uh, and Fort George to Fort Malden to oppose Hull and basically besieges Fort Detroit he meets up with Tecumseh uh, and some members of the Tecumseh Shawnee-led Confederacy, and they encircle the fort. And Brock encourages reports. He actually basically writes a report and passes it through the lines to say to Hall to basically say this great Indian horde is going to descend upon the fort and I can't quite control them. So you yeah. better surrender. Yeah. And don't you love that, right? Like two white guys, one white guy just playing into the fear of the other, uh, right right into the other white guy, like yeah. knowing, you know, he and probably— a pretty he, old guy too. I mean he's yeah. 60, which is pretty old for the time. Um, yeah. But I mean Brock probably knows deep down like what that what that fear and what that anxiety is like, mm-hmm. you know, being 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 a white man in, in the British military – right, being a white man in the British military and having to deal with these Native Americans, not totally understanding them, seeing how they act, how different it is and and whenever it's something that's uncomfortable and the, the unknown is always scary. And uh, so Brock played into that and was like, hey, you know, I know what I would do if you surrendered to me. Uh, and my guys and all my troops, but you know, I have all these Native Americans here, and I don't know if I can control them. So I don't know. Use your imagination. <laughs> yeah. So Hall, so Hall basically has more troops uh, than both Tecumseh's Confederacy and the regulars that uh, Brock has rushed to the fort. But uh, basically, his he's basically bluffed into surrendering right this is if you think of it as a poker analogy uh the one side doesn't quite have as good of a hand but because they sense weakness they bluff very strong and and hall folds so he surrenders the fort and all of his troops to a small 2500 soldiers yeah 700 civilians and he even wrote that he surrendered them to keep them from quote the horrors of an indian massacre so clearly that threat uh loomed very large in his mind he also had no idea that he had a larger force than the british and the natives and he didn't think he had the um gunpowder yeah he didn't and he he didn't think he could withstand a long siege yeah and so he figured why even fight if i know i'm going to lose in the end anyway so uh this is a catastrophe for the united states right they were supposed to basically take upper canada with this army if they're incapable of even mounting an offensive And then they end up surrendering, losing three critical forts, Fort Detroit being the the biggest. And now the whole Northwest Territories are threatened, and the only bastion of defense is Fort Wayne. Yeah, which is in North, yeah, I was about to say, which is in Northeast um, Indiana today. And when you think about it, Hull had, like, like you mentioned, Hull had the the bulk of the American army. Like this was the army that was supposed to invade Canada and take Canada. And he literally just gave it away. Um, And it was so embarrassing. I mean, he got court-martialed for this. Yes. Um, And he was even heard saying after he got word from Brock, he was heard saying, quote, my God, what shall I do with these women and children? So he was, I mean, he was very afraid that if he did not give up, then it would end up being a massacre, and uh, that would be far worse than giving up a fort, right? Now, this is a critical setback for the United States, but had they had better strategic coordination, perhaps the Americans could have attacked Canada on multiple fronts. So if 
Brock and a bulk of some Canadian forces are invading into Michigan, perhaps the Americans at Fort Niagara could cross the River Niagara and attack Fort George. Right, Chris? Yeah. So why did they not do that? Well, they did. It just didn't go well. (laughs) So uh, basically the same kind of problems that Hull had, uh, General Stephen Van uh, Rensselaer also had for his assault across the Niagara River, which happened on October 11th. So this is after the surrender of Fort Detroit. Brock, because the British have naval dominance on Lake Erie, are a- is able to shuttle his regulars quickly back to Fort George. And they fight actually at the battle. It's called Queenston Heights, which is outside of Fort George on the Ontario side of uh uh, the Niagara River. And basically, the United States troops have an early advantage. However, New York militiamen don't really want to cross the Niagara River to fight in Canada. They, weren't, they, were, they were more interested in defending New York rather than attacking Canada. So this early success ends up, they can't really push and develop on it. So they're kind of stuck there. And Brock is able to organize the defense and the counterattack. And basically, the 1,000 Americans who uh, cross the river are pushed back. Casualties are high, about 30%. It's a great victory. However, the British lose a critical casualty. Isaac Brock is is uh, is killed in the battle. So by the end of eighteen twelve, well, there's one there's one other thing, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh sorry. So this is just the Upper Canada portion of it. The if folks remember back to the Revolutionary War, we had talked about the Great War Path up from the Hudson River Valley, from basically Manhattan all the way Mm -hmm. up to Lake Champlain into the St. Lawrence uh, River Valley in Montreal. And the Americans tried to march that up that way in the Revolutionary War and failed and to try to conquer Montreal. And they're going to try again in 1812 as well. And that's General Henry Dearborn, who has 6,000 troops and basically marches all the way up to Lake Champlain, meets some resistance, and his army just kind of grinds to a halt. Basically, they're, they fight – even though these are just low-level skirmishes, they kind of fight themselves out and the invasion is a failure. So to your point, Chris, by the end of 1813, it's been a kind of a catastrophe for the Americans. And end of 1812. I mean, yeah, pardon me. Sorry. The end yeah. of 1812, it's been a, a, a catastrophe for the Americans. Yeah. So they've lost Fort Mackinac and Fort Michigan the whole, Mackinac yeah, the whole in Michigan northern ter- Michigan Peninsula. Yeah. They lost Fort Dearborn. They gave up Fort Detroit. Um, they lost at the Battle of Niagara and they marched 6,000 men north toward Montreal and also lost. Yeah. And technically it's the, the Battle of Queen, Queenston Heights. Just Oh yeah. Sorry. The Battle of Queenston Heights. Yeah. And the only silver line there is that Brock was killed. Yeah. I mean, well, not that it's ever good when someone yeah, dies. If, I didn't mean it like that, well, but for, you from understand. The Ameri- yeah. From the American yes. perspective, uh, uh, and, and just for the record, the reason why we keep referring to the Canadians is because... Brock's uh, – basically the British forces, there's some regulars, but for the most part, they're supplemented by uh, uh, Canadian militia. And we'll talk about the French-Canadian militia some in 1813 when we get to that. So just to recap, 1812, the United States, this is going to be quick. This is going to be easy. Thomas Jefferson is all like, man, we're just going to march up there. We're going to take it. I mean, he even said the acquisition of Canada will be a matter of marching. <laughs> and it ends up mm, not nice. being the case. Uh, the Shawnee and Tecumseh. Have well, at least he was optimistic. He was very optimistic. I mean, <laughs> this is, again, why we study history is – so that's the ending of of the war of eighteen of the year eighteen twelve. And gotcha. And now now we're moving into eighteen thirteen. Eighteen thirteen. This is the American strike back, right? It's the second okay. act. So uh, William Henry Harrison, the great victor of the Battle of Tippecanoe that happened in eighteen 18- Tippecanoe and Tyler too. That's right. F- future president William Henry Harrison. <laughs> he is uh, given a promotion and is basically dispatched to Fort Wayne to kind of try to salvage what's happened in the North, uh, Northwest Territories. And it's up to him to kind of figure out how are we going to take back Detroit. Um, the Americans, because of what had happened in 1812, also realized that they have to have naval dominance in the Great Lakes. So under Commodore Perry, a 
fleet is being built uh, along the shores of Lake Erie to fight the British fleet. This is happening simultaneously. Uh, let me scroll down on my notes here. All right, so William Henry Harrison uh, basically raises a Kentucky militia, immediately departs for Fort Wayne. Uh, this is going to be his base of operations to reach out to try to re- uh, to reconquer the uh, the Michigan Territory. Mm-hmm. And they basically he has several columns dispatched that are supposed to converge on Fort Detroit. One of them goes to uh, Fort Meigs, and Fort Meigs is actually where Toledo is nowadays, and this is actually along Toledo, Ohio. Toledo, Ohio, correct. Yeah. And this is along the Maumee River, which actually flows from Fort Wayne all the way up to Toledo to Lake Erie. So it's a very logical place to basically send troops to. And, and this is this is the spring of eighteen. I mean, by this point, when you're talking about getting to Fort Meigs, we're spring of this is like May of eighteen. Yeah. So the so there, I mean, there's there's still a detachment there. So uh, the first column that goes there basically tries to push further north and actually fights a battle at Frenchtown, Michigan. And this is another example of Tecumseh's good battlefield leadership. Basically, the Americans get the upper hand early. The natives fall back into the forest. They basically pull the whole column in with them. They then encircle them, and a column of 900 troops is reduced to only 150 survivors who make it back. So it's this horrible disaster, another massacre. It's called uh, the. Uh, uh, it'll be the Americans later will you know similar to remember the Alamo. They'll have remember Raison River where this disaster had struck. Mm-hmm. Similar to what happened at Fort Dearborn, there were some violent deaths of Americans uh, perpetrated by Native Americans that will live in American memory. And what- Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. There was Colonel Henry Proctor, right? Yes, he's and, the British um, commander who took over yep. for uh, Isaac Brock, who will end up having a bad relationship with Tecumseh. Yeah, and if it this, so this all happened, by the way, for context, in the winter of 1813 before the siege of Fort Meg. So Henry Proctor was working with in, in conjunction with Tecumseh. Um, and part of Harrison, a detachment of Harrison's army was defeated along the Ravon River, the River Ravon. Um, it's spelled like Raven. I always call it Raven, but we'll be fancy and call it Raven. I, so I believe I believe you're you supposed it. to call it Raven. I mean, it's a <laughs> okay, right, it, Detroit probably, French. If, okay, yeah, it's prob- probably not named after a Raven. Um, and uh, so Proctor, from from what I can remember, he left the prisoners. And they're really like the guard for these American prisoners were not adequate and the Native Americans just overwhelmed them and massacred so, like flat like murdered like 60 American prisoners or so, I mean like a really high number pretty bad yeah and again just as a disclaimer here remember that tit for tat killings have been happening on the Northwest Territory for many years you had had the Indian Wars of 1790 Pontiac's Rebellion this the mm-hmm. native confederacies that form in the Northwest Territories along the Great Lakes are really fighting for their survivals and I mean, basically against genocide, because at the end of all of this, they're going to all be moved into the Oklahoma territory and their tribal numbers will be diminished into the hundreds from uh, peaks in the tens of thousands. So, you know, (laughs) we just want to prevent some of the moralizing here, because oftentimes the stories of uh, native massacres are used later for justifications of lots of other nasty things. So. Anyways, the cycles of yes. violence. No, can- <laughs> I'm no, I'm I'm glad I'm I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, so that brings us to the uh, to the spring of 1813, the siege of Fort Meigs. Yes. So Proctor and Tecumseh uh, have an allied uh, campaign against Fort Meigs. They besiege the fort. Uh, William Henry Harrison's troops relieve the siege, but again, they are tricked into uh, aggressively pursuing. The Shawnee forces and are again uh, surrounded with a sizable amount of them cut off and uh, uh, encircled and killed. Uh, And this is where uh, Tecumseh is reported as intervening to prevent uh, the further killing of wounded Americans. Uh, But he and Proctor have a serious fallout about the nature of uh, the conflict that they're fighting. And Tecumseh basically just says, go hang out with the petticoats basically calls him uh, a coward. And this is going to be the friction and mistrust between Proctor and Tecumseh will probably spell the doom of the Shawnee Confederacy as well as uh, uh, 
well, Tecumseh's life later on. So Fort Meigs is relieved. William Henry, while they lost this battle outside of it, which is sometimes referred to as the Battle of Miami, the, the fort is actually, uh, the siege is lifted, so the fort is safe. And this is setting up the, the, pin, uh, the pivotal battle that will happen in 1813, uh, which is on the water of Lake Erie, right? <laughs> now, this isn't ship of the lines like Trafalgar or Master and Commander for anyone who's seen those movies. These aren't the big frigates like the USS Constitution if you've ever been to Boston. These are smaller ships, sloops. Uh, schooners, you know, uh, you know, they hold 20, 15, maybe 30 guns tops. Uh, they're still sizable, but uh, these are not, you know, big, big ships. And this is the Battle of Putin Bay. And this is the f- and this is September, September 10th, yeah. 1813. This We've is, now moved into the fall of 1813. Yeah. And Oliver Perry, and he is the Commodore who leads the American squadron against the British squadron and successfully defeats the British squadron and has the very famous line, we have met the enemy and he is ours. And this is in reference to the capturing of the ships. And that's why if you ever have a Great Lakes Brewing Company beer, there's one called Commodore Perry. (laughs) There you go. It's all making sense now. It's all making sense now, right? It all comes back to beer in some way or form. Of course. Uh, but this this is a critical victory from a strategic purpose because it prevents the British from being able to command the Great Lakes by funneling their limited troops or transporting them very quickly back and forth across the lakes. And this opens up on Upper Canada for an American invasion from New York where they attack York, the provincial capital, and burn it. And this is where – this is – York will become Toronto. Uh, unfortunately, the American supply lines are overextended, and they retreat back uh, to the United States after the fact. Uh, something similar will happen around Fort George and Niagara. There'll be some minor skirmishing there, and the fort will be abandoned. Um, uh, I do want to point out real quick before we, we move on from the burning of York. The burning of York is pretty important because the British were mm, not happy a bit about perturbed. it. <laughs> yeah, they, they weren't very happy about that. And what they will end up doing in response is burning down Washington, D.C., specifically burning down the White House, um, which was in response to the Americans burning down York. Uh, but, you know, the one thing about this, the, the victory of Putin Bay raises the American morale after they just seen defeat after defeat after defeat. Um, and the British fell back from Detroit, which, of course, as you mentioned, sort of opened up an opportunity to launch another invasion into Upper Canada. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Were you going to get into the Battle of Thames? Yeah, well, I was going to okay. just mention that because of the loss of naval superiority, uh, Colonel Proctor abandons Fort Detroit, fearful that he won't mm-hmm. be able to resupply it and could be cut off. And this is where the Shawnee Confederacy retreats across into Canada. Um, so William Henry Harrison is able to recapture Detroit without a shot being fired. And this is where he will be bold and aggressive and actually cross into Canada and be victorious at the Battle of, of Thames, Thames River. Yeah. And that and the Battle of Thames River or the Thames – um, depending on where you're from, how you Thames, pronounce Thames. it, right? Thames, 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 Thames yeah. You can uh, tell our different accents, accents it, it, between it, it, these, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, River Thames. And the the one thing that's important here is that uh, Tecumseh is killed. So this is a, a critical battle in that um, the natives lose Tecumseh in this battle, um, which y- you you can imagine is is pretty big deal. So. That brings us to, for, to, to the end of 1813 and the end of this first theater of war. It, what else would you like to include? I know you have more you want to say, Zach. Well, there's one other thing that we should mention, which is uh, an American force will att- reattempt to march up the Great War Path uh, up the Hudson River Valley towards Montreal, and they will be met by a Quebecois, a French-Canadian militia force of smaller size that will successfully defeat them at the Battle of Chantagal. Pardon my French. It's horrible. I'm trying my best. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a critical moment if you're interested in uh, Quebecois history or French-Canadian history. The French-Canadians, uh, the Quebecois, uh, basically rallied 
under the British sovereign. Uh, this in part this is because Britain, from practicality purposes, had granted them some legal rights under the Quebec Act of 1774, which protected their uh, their religious rights because they were Catholics. So largely, a force of French Canadians rally to prevent the American army from mon- marching to Montreal. And remember, if Montreal had fallen, uh, Upper Canada would have been cut off from Lower Canada because you wouldn't have been able to resupply mm-hmm. from the St. Lawrence River. So this was a critical moment. And the these French Canadians in part rallied to the British side because they were fearful that the Americans wouldn't uh, respect their religious rights, whereas the British had. Yeah. So... The end of 1813, the Americans have struck back. They've defeated the British on Lake Erie. They've proven that they're the better seamen. Burned down York. Yeah, they've burned down York. They've recaptured Fort Detroit. And they've uh, uh, basically have control again of the Michigan Territory. And Tecumseh has been killed. And the Shawnee Confederacy, as an effective fighting force, appears to be damaged. So you could say at the end of 1830, hey, everything's coming up roses for the Americans. However, something has changed afoot in Europe. Napoleon has been defeated. The Anglo armies that have been fighting in the navy that's been stuck in Europe will now be unleashed upon American shores. So that great goal of conquering Canada that had started this all out, it's, it's, a, it's a dream. It's a phantom. It won't happen now. And <laughs> now you're right, his, his majesty's navy is coming back with revenge on the mind. Well, I hope I hope next week with episode um, one hundred and three, I can match your enthusiasm. I'm I'm not sure I can trying to hype it, doing, man. Yeah, I'm not sure I can continue doing like the movie trailer voice, um, <laughs> <laughs> like, just, just building it up more and more and more. But that's exactly that. Really, is the perfect segue into next week, though, because that's what I will be getting into next week. And next week will be uh, detailing the British response to the American victories in 1813, and they have defeated napoleon and now they're ready to focus all their attention on the united states of america which is not a good thing for the united states of america or for specifically the city of washington dc and that's what we'll be covering next week zach thanks so much for joining me man always a pleasure chris yeah and thank you the listener for checking out this episode um you know thanks for listening And hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed.